how was the hypothesis formed at all that ketamine, instead of a million other interventions or you know, pharmacological tools, might be useful for repairing the structural damage of stress or alleviating depression? Was it something that was observed in the field? For instance, one of the rumors that I've heard is that veterans who are administered this anesthetic seem to experience less PTSD. That was somehow recorded in the field, and that led to hypothesis generation and, and use of ketamine. That it seems pretty tenuous. I don't know if that's true, but how did it go from anesthetic to of all the things we could choose, we're going to mess around with ketamine. First off, I love hearing stories about how I, I and uh, Dennis came up with ketamine for depression. <laughs> <laughs> but it's one well, of my, like, like people, uh, you know, it's like, oh, that's a great idea. No. <laughs> <laughs> just, to be clear, this isn't specific to you. It's just I, I, I'm so fascinated by the the genesis stories of these things. I think they're important. So I'd love to hear the the real story as opposed to the Santa Claus version. So the real story is not related to depression at all. It's related to to schizophrenia. Mm. So it so happens in the great cosmic universe of coincidence that a friend of my dad's in Detroit, friend of our, and, and his family was a friend of our family, and we went on vacation together. I remember intertubing down a river in northern Michigan. I grew up in Michigan. Intertubing down a river with his daughter. We were maybe 10 or 9 or 10 at the time. His daughter is now an, an is named Joan Luby. Um, she's now an endowed professor, in, an expert in child psychiatry at, at Washington University in St. Louis. Anyway, this fellow's name was um, Elliot Luby. And in 1959, he published a paper that was the first time fencyclidine or CERNAL was given to a human being. And this happened at the Lafayette Clinic in Detroit, an entity, a building which no longer exists, unfortunately. An extremely, extremely generative place in its era. And he said that if you gave Cernal, which, which was the company name for fencyclidine, PCP, angel dust, if you gave it to people, it produced something like schizophrenia in them. Hmm. The thing was, that's 1959, and the mechanism, the fact that it blocked the NMDA glutamate receptor wasn't identified until the mid-1980s, or in 83, 84. So it was this fascinating observation, which couldn't go anywhere scientifically. But they did research, and this is going to bring us to other topics that we'll probably talk about in which they compared the effects of pencyclidine to the effects of LSD in people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good old psychomimetic. <laughs> yeah, it's just, just unbelievably courageous and creative, trailblazing psychopharmacology at a time when they just had no idea what was happening in the brain, the neurobiology. And in the early 60s, another trailblazing scientist also associated with that group was a guy named Ed Domino, who was a pharmacologist. It's a great name, too. <laughs> yeah. My cousin, Tom, I apologize for mentioning his name, who was a medical student at the University of Michigan, brought me to sit in one of his classes when I was applying to medical schools. And it just happened to be Ed Domino. And my friends, my cousin and his friends, when Ed Domino came up to talk, sang a bit of the Van Morrison song, Domino, <laughs> may be familiar with. Anyway, unforgettable to me because Ed became a very dear friend and colleague uh, over the years. But Ed was the first to give ketamine to animals and humans. 
And because it was a shorter acting, safer version of a small structural modification in the phencyclidine chemical structure Mm -hmm. that made it possible to be shorter acting, more manageable, easier to control. And for what reason was he uh, administering the ketamine in, in those particular studies? For anesthesia. For anesthesia. Got it. Yeah. There was a fellow, Corson, who was working with him on some of those studies. So there's a line that I love. You know, one of these, I love portentous lines in scientific literature. Like, I think it's the last line in the Watson and Crick discovery of DNA where they say, it has not escaped our notice that the elucidation of the structure of DNA may have relevance for the transmission of genetic traits or something like that, something unbelievably understated. <laughs> and there's a line in one of the first papers on ketamine that Ed Domino wrote, which was, when you give ketamine to humans, we notice that sensory information can get uh, to sensory cortex unimpeded, but is altered or, or blocked in its transmission to association cortex. We call this dissociation mm. and this process dissociative anesthesia, or something like that. Mm. And wow, what a profound cast-off sentence, right? <laughs> Buried in the discussion of a paper in an anesthesia journal. Mm. But really what happened was that this group of pioneers had an incredible tool, but no conceptual framework to use it to generate, you know, real deep scientific insight. And and that's because they were 30 years ahead of the field or something like that. And, you know, it, it wasn't even known that there was a binding site for phencyclidine. So first studies published in 1959, it wasn't even known that there was a binding site for phencyclidine until 1970. Now, by binding site, you mean a receptor that it could... A plate? Yeah. Well, some kind of something. Some kind of something. They didn't know that it acted in a specific way at a specific target in the brain. What that target was, they didn't yet know until the early 1980s that it was a glutamate receptor. Yeah, it's wild. They didn't even know that there was a binding site for fencyclidine until a really landmark paper in 1979 from Steve and Suzanne Zukin. So it was darkness, right? It was like the Middle Ages of neuroscience. And so they, they had a brilliant insight, but they couldn't take it anywhere because there was no framework for it. So I joined the faculty in 88 at Yale. And I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And my boss said to me, Dr. Chani said, well, you can be the chief of the schizophrenia program or the deputy chief of the PTSD program. And I, I said, well, I like the idea of being the chief. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I went into the field of schizophrenia research. And so I found myself as a new, completely, you know, inexperienced schizophrenia researcher setting up a research program related to the neurobiology and treatment of schizophrenia. And it happened to be just at that time that clozapine, which is an antipsychotic medication that's a little bit more effective than other antipsychotics, uh, was introduced. And I've been raised studying monoamine pharmacology. That's what I knew. That's really what I had anticipated studying. And I tried, I treated patients with clozapine and and I thought it was a pretty good medication. But I didn't want my legacy after 40 years of schizophrenia research to be that he figured out why clozapine was a little bit more effective than other antipsychotic medications. So I felt like I just had to go out of the box. And, you know, this is, um, this is where my father's legacy really had, had a big impact. It's like, well, if you could do anything, what would you do? And 
And it was like, well, I don't want to study these few cells contributing to the, you know, dopamine or norepinephrine. I want to study the main information highway of the brain. Just a few years before, they figured out that drugs like ketamine, PCP, blocked this receptor for glutamate. And so what brought me to ketamine was really the effort to probe glutamate synaptic function in higher cortical circuits as a way of understanding the cognitive impairments, negative symptoms, and other aspects of schizophrenia. Hmm. And so our path in our institution, my path, was the development of a research program on glutamate psychopharmacology, developing circuit and mechanistic hypotheses. One of my collaborators in those days was a pharmacologist named Bita Mogadam. And in 1997, she published a paper that showed that ketamine released glutamate in the brain at the very same doses that we were using, the equivalent of the very same doses that we were using to produce changes in cognition and psychosis related to schizophrenia. Mm. You know, that line of research has its own story because we began using the ketamine administration is a platform for trying to ad- identify novel alternatives to antipsychotic medication for the treatment of schizophrenia. And, and that has had its own life and story, and maybe someday we'll, we'll talk about that. But one of the things Bita found, which turned out to be profoundly important for the antidepressant story, was if you give it at the sub-anesthetic dose that we use to study cognition, it released glutamate. If you give it at anesthetic doses, it depresses glutamate, and it's not antidepressant at those doses. Hmm. And if you give it at even a little bit lower level, it doesn't stimulate the glutamate release. There's this Hmm. tiny, narrow window where it's producing dissociation, psychosis, and a number of the other effects that we're really interested in, where it works. And it turns out that that little narrow dose window is the dose range where it works for the treatment of depression. We just stumbled on that because it was optimal. You know, the thing was we couldn't give higher doses to people because we needed them to perform cognitive tests and be able to answer our questions. When we gave people much higher doses of ketamine, they would have, you know, pretty interesting experiences but they couldn't answer any of our questions. So it wasn't any good for me as a research tool. I mean, I remember one person that we gave this higher dose of ketamine to who couldn't answer a lot of our questions, but he was holding onto the bed really tightly. And I said, well, that's interesting. Why were you holding onto the bed? He said, well, uh, basically the the dress, the blue in the dress of the interviewer had become outer space. The white polka dots in her dress had become planets and solar systems. And his bed was flying among the planets and the the (laughs) outer planets. And he was afraid that if he let go of the bed, that he'd be cast adrift in outer space and, and not make it back. Well, that was really fascinating. Seems reasonable. <laughs> yeah, it was really, really interesting, but useless. I couldn't get him. To, he couldn't do any tests. He couldn't perform anything. Yeah. So what that essentially did was create the upper bound of the dosing that we were using with ketamine. And then the lower doses just turned out to be completely ineffective and have, have repeatedly been shown to be so in in single doses in antidepressant trials. So that's how we got to ketamine. And that's how we got to the dose of ketamine and the route of ketamine that we used in the treatment studies. Because what we did was to adapt the dose and the duration of administration. Like you could have said, why 40 minutes? Well, because ketamine is such a short-acting drug, we administer it for 40 minutes to give us a time window where people are having the subjective effects of ketamine where we can test behavioral and cognition. That's why we had the slow infusion in the initial study. And we just imported that into depression. And that has become 
the standard treatment infusion paradigm for racemic ketamine administration for the treatment of depression. 